Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and uh, welcome to You've Got the Power. I've got an uh, exciting uh, guest here today, Dr. Evan Katz. Uh, as you may know, uh, Dr. Katz is someone I've worked with for many, many years. And uh, ultimately, if you come to my practice and you haven't had DMX yet, uh, Evan will do the DMX. But more importantly, uh, Evan has published a very important um, paper in the world of DMX, where he actually took a control group without symptoms and a patient group was able to compare those two and uh, look at the uh, various metrics to try to see if there were certain measurements on DMX that were more associated with symptoms. And you know, the reason why that's so much better than many of the metrics we use for craniocervical instability is that many of the metrics we use don't really have symptomatic and normal uh, groups that they've compared. Uh, sometimes the measurements have just been carried over from traditional medicine, um, but there's very few of those measurements, as I've said many, many times before, that have actually been looked at in that way, in the way that Evan did in his DMX paper. So, so welcome, Evan. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you. So I think we'll do what we did last time, which is we'll spend five or 10 minutes talking about various things, and then we'll go answer questions. Uh, we had more questions than we could get to last time. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to get to all the questions uh, uh, today. Um, Evan, let's start just talking about digital motion x-ray. How did you get into digital motion x-ray and, and how how did you discover it, if you will? Yeah, so uh, funny enough, it's how and when I met you. I was out here practicing. I practiced with my wife. And I was actually at a conference in Chicago, it was a spinal conference, and um, digital motion x-ray was there. Um, the company was there. I was looking at uh, uh, the technology because I was like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, at the time, especially, I felt like for a chiropractor where I was like, well, it's moving. We're like static, I always thought made sense to a degree, but most of our patients hurt when they moved. And when they had this technology that was more diagnostic than fluoro um, because you didn't get that ghosting. So uh, I was there and I was like, wow, this, this really makes a lot of sense to me clinically. Um, so from there, we ended up getting in touch with the people who made it and we ended up purchasing one and had in our office for, it's been like, I think about over 20 years now. And during that time, we kept seeing a certain symptom pain population or symptomatic symptomatic population and we started seeing these similar findings on dmx and one of them um, was this upper cervical instability from lateral bending um, so that kind of sent us down the road of there's something here um, there's a commonality that a lot of these patients are sharing unfortunately one of the biggest commonalities was uh, being shunned by the medical profession called crazy being called crazy um, but then we started to see that this is an objective finding that we're seeing in this population. There has to be something here. So we started going down the road, you know, with you and others to say, how abnormal is this? Um, and what else are we seeing on these um, on these movement studies? And that's kind of how we we got into it. So, yeah. So tell me a little bit about, uh, I guess, first describe for people that are watching um, what you do in a DMX, uh, and then, you know, what you found in the paper that you published on DMX. Yeah. So the 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 DMX is you come to our office. Um, my wife, Dr. Shauna, shoots them a lot, and uh, or myself, and we have you go through a number of different movements. We have you do a nodding movement. We have you do the typical flexion extension. Um, and then we have you do oblique flexion extension and look at what are called the facet joints. So here's like, you know, giant, gigantic neck. So we can look at the facet joints and then we'll have you look um, with rotation and then we'll look through the mouth and then we're going to have the person tilt and trying to keep their head within mid range so that we can look to see if this part of C1 starts to translate over checking the uh, integrity of those ligaments. And that's the view we do after that. We then, uh, I import the 
image, we digitize it, meaning we're going to measure it based on one millimeter equals one millimeter, one degree equals one degree. Um, we measure it based on the established normals. Now, uh, American Medical Association has established normals at the end range, so we analyze that. And then we also look at, based on our paper, we'll look at what's called facet gapping, and then we'll look at the upper cervical um, upper cervical structures and stability, as well as the shape of the cervical curve, instability in the mid-cervical spine. Um, and from there, what we found in our paper, um, we found a lot of things that we weren't really, um, we weren't really aware of, uh, that we didn't know. Uh, and one of this was, as you and I talked about, initially when we started looking at this 20 years ago, there were papers that looked at upper cervical instability, and a lot of them were on um, either rheumatoid patients, and I believe there was one on people with Down syndrome because they could have upper cervical instability. And there was an established normal that two millimeters or over two millimeters was unstable. And what we found in our paper was that that wasn't true. And we took these asymptomatic population, meaning they never had pain that lasted a week or more, right? So maybe someone woke up like, oh, my neck was a little tight and it subsided. Um, but they were allowed in. But patients had had pain that was lasting, um, in this, in our case, six weeks or more, right? So it wasn't, they didn't just go away. Um, most of them were in crashes. Uh, they had some kind of trauma. And then we looked to see what's the difference. And as it related to upper cervical instability, we actually found that about three, it wasn't two millimeters. We found a lot of the asymptomatic population had two. So we found that now that we had such a larger population base than the other papers that were done, um, comparing asymptomatic and, um, and symptomatic, we found that that cutoff range where we saw a large separation was at around three millimeters of C1 tilting on C2. But what we also found was the periodental space. So if you look at the dens of C2, the little finger-like projection, which is being covered by the front of C1, this space here, which is what Dr. Centeno had developed where you inject through, the correct, right? Yeah. Through that space, um, we found that um, you can see some rotational aspect occur with little translation, but we found that if you also have translation and you had to change that periodontal space, we never saw that finding in the asymptomatic population. So that was, if you had both, that was a really strong finding in the symptomatic population that just wasn't seen in the asymptomatic population. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, so if it was three millimeters, there was a two-thirds chance that you were looking at someone who is symptomatic yep. or one confidence or one standard deviation. If it was four millimeters, there was a 95% correct standard deviation chance that you were looking at a symptomatic person. Correct. And let's talk about just for a few minutes here before we go to questions on that idea between having something on your imaging and have it be something in common with a lot of people walking around out there without pain versus findings on imaging that are probably associated with, with pain because it, it, it's such an important concept that I think we don't really see very often in, in medicine, right? We really see these imaging studies where we're saying, what are the things that are on this imaging study that are usually associated with someone who's symptomatic? versus what are the things in this imaging study that anyone walking around the street could have? So mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I think there's a lot, um, you know, and I hear a lot uh, where like, oh, that a, a lot of asymptomatic people can have that. Um, so therefore, you may not really be symptomatic or you may not be injured. Um, there is a difference when you're dealing with a symptomatic population. You're like, well, they're not asymptomatic. Um, but what we did find is objectively, uh, there is a difference between the certain findings and the number of findings too. Um, we found uh, the asymptomatic population, even if they had a finding, it was lower of a likelihood that it was there, but they also had less. So the, the symptomatic population, it was rare that they just had upper cervical instability. They had upper cervical instability uh, uh, facet instability or instability down lower compared to the symptomatic or the asymptomatic, which maybe they had uh, a small percentage had upper cervical instability, but uh, some of those other findings weren't there as well. Now, in terms of sim symptomatology is where I know myself and I know Dr. Centeno, um, we're not just going off just the image, right? It's what do you feel? What happens when you do this movement? 
um, what happens when I do this physical exam? So the image is one part. Um, and then from there, does your story line up with it? Does your, um, does your clinical exams line up with it? And that, that to me, honestly, was, was one of the most um, fascinating parts and one of the most rewarding parts, but also the saddest part, my wife and I say, is over the years, the amount of patients that we've had that cried because we were able to explain or show them and they weren't happy of course no one's happy to find these but to finally say oh i'm not crazy because we've seen patients for five years 10 years 15 years i've, I've had mris i've had x-rays i've done this my neurologist did brains and they said that it's i'm crazy and you're like well you have a pretty large instability that is correlated and when you start to talk to patients um like oh well what bothers you and then they tell you what position bothers you. And then you see the pathology occur during that movement. That's a huge, strong correlation. And that's what we saw. Okay. So let's get to some questions here. Uh, hi, Dr. Katz, big fan here. I uh, fear many CCI patients have the CPP, uh, chiropractic biophysics is getting flared up. In general, how do you manage treatment with up and down flare ups in patients? So this is a great question and thank you. Um, Thank you for the kind words. Uh, so with CBP, which is chiropractic biophysics, um, there's a, it, it actually is the most published or one of the most published chiropractic techniques with structure and, and mechanics and stability. When the way that I practice um, CBP, especially with upper cervical patients is, is different than the non CCI population. And I always start with a, a less is more approach. With that, if you're getting flared up, you need to understand or your doc needs to understand why. What are you doing? Because what I've seen with a lot of the CBP docs that I talk to, a lot of the ones I look up to, and we talk about this all the time, is a lot what will happen is, and I don't know if I could share my screen to show, and this is something Dr. Centeno and I have no, do you have a do you have a present button down there? Um, oh yeah, I do. Yeah, is um, is uh, I'll put it in a sec. Is you could have hypermobility in the upper neck, but what's very what's not talked about a lot either is below it you might have hypomobility, and what we've seen is with patients that are getting adjusted and then maybe they're getting CBP type traction where they're extending their neck what is happening is the mid neck isn't moving at all. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, does this, does this work, Chris? Can you see it? Um, okay. Hold on one sec. Uh, can you see that? I don't mean to show that there, but can you see my screen? Um, yeah, let me add it to the, just so I can show, cause this is, this is an important thing that if there are CGI sure. docs that are watching this, you can see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Is, um, is the hypo mobility. So what we see here, so what your doc should know is here's an example. When this person moves, there's something called coupling motion that occurs in the spine. Coupling motion is when you move, other movements are going to happen. If you laterally flex your neck, you tilt to the side, the spinous processes should rotate to the other side. When you extend, a lot of extension is going to occur at the, at the craniocervical junction, but you're also supposed to have movement occur here. So this is a patient with tons of hypermobility up here with almost little to no movement down here, right? So when we see that, a lot of times these are the patients we see flaring up because what's happening is, um, I got to see how I go back to the screen here. Okay. Uh, I could stop sharing my screen. Um, is they can flare up because as they're trying to extend them to put a curve in their neck, they're extending their skull base. And that can affect that mild neural bridge. That, that you're taking the ligaments that are already too lax and now they're extending them because down below isn't moving well. So those are things where I always look at like, hey, maybe minimize the types of what's called two-way compression extension traction where you're getting more of what's called a forward pull in the neck but you're not causing the upper neck to move or even extend at all. 
So those are things that we look at and then they need to be aware of that. Um, your doc should be. Okay. Uh, Dr. Katz, uh, have you been able to treat, cure CCI in patients that are more in the chronic category? Could you elaborate on the patients in your overhang reduction case study? Yeah, so we we were one of the first ones that did publish a paper on this because we've been seeing these people, the, these patients for 20 years, speaking to people about this, other providers. And our, you know, I remember, I don't know if Dr. Centeno remembers this, but I do remember like it was yesterday when Dr. Centeno came up with his idea for the pickle procedure. Um, and we we're talking about this and we've all, not all, myself, Dr. Centeno, um, we've seen these patients for years and we're like, well, how, what do we do about it, right? That was the big question. What I've seen in my practice is we did uh, publish a paper in the Journal of Clinical Medicine where we took patients with upper cervical instability. And chronic is sometimes, a, I don't, I'm, not, I'm never gonna say anything is easy when you're dealing with the human body, but we've gotten great results with, with chronic because Chronic patients sometimes can respond pretty well because anything you do towards normal feels good. Um, so what we did in our paper was we took patients with abnormal cervical curves, um, like more cervical kyphosis and upper cervical instability. Usually you're not just going to have one pathology, right? You're not just going to be like, oh, it's just your upper neck and everything else is perfect. So we want to address all of it. How does one area affect the other in terms of coupling motion? And what we found, and there are studies that talk about how the mid cervical spine, in fact, actually even as down as the sacral base angle can affect changes of the uh, sagittal alignment or the shape of the neck or the shape of the spine. Um, what we did was we looked at the shape of the neck when they were outside of normal. And we're like, you know, if you have an abnormal cervical curvature from what is established normal, and this is a giant neck here, of course, and then all of a sudden it buckles. In order to keep what's called horizontal gaze, the patient, the person is going to hyperextend the skull base. So now you're loading the ligaments, you're loading some of the facet capsules to see straight. So we were like, well, if this is really unstable up here, I'm not gonna necessarily just adjust it because the ligaments aren't holding it in, but this may be an injury, a primary injury, but now there's a secondary complication right? If you, if you try to balance a bowling ball on something and it's not, and the structure is normal, and then all of a sudden you change the structure, it's now less stable up here. That was our hypothesis. And that's what other papers have shown as well. So what we did is as we started to restore that normal lordosis, we did pre and post images blindly, meaning we didn't know which patients were which. Um, and we found not only did symptomatically they improved, but their instabilities reduced as their cervical curves improved. Gotcha. Um, hi, doctor. How long does DMX last and how quick does it take to diagnose some of the CCI if they do after the DMX? Um, so uh, not quite sure what that question means, but I think I understand it. Okay. I think he's asking how long does, does it take to do the DMX? So the DMX can take us anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour. Obviously, some CCI patients, we, we, have, to, we have to stop a lot. They get nauseous. Their heart starts to race. Um, and that is the one unfortunate thing we do in the test is we want to see when you're uncomfortable. We want to see, like most patients, if you're a CCI patient watching this, you know what makes you worse, and it's usually movement. So we're going to put you in those positions to see if it's abnormal during those positions. And that should help your doc also if you're seeing a CVP doc to understand how to adjust you and what positions or exercises to put you in. So we, we do the test. Once the test is done, my wife and I can see it right away, but we're not going to say anything until we measure it. And then of course you want your doc to do the appropriate evaluation. So let's say you're one of Dr. Centeno's patients. We do a DMX. We see the results right away. We do the image right, or the digitization right away. We email it to him. He's going to see that. And yes, there's signs of abnormalities, but he's also going to do an exam. And then putting all those pieces in is how you get the diagnosis of CCI, um, right? Okay, here's the image. The image is abnormal, but are you symptomatic with it? And is it correlated to those things? Because the one thing I want to say too, and I, I, I'm, I'm 
not to speak for you, Dr. Centeno, but I'm sh I think you'll agree because I know I've talked to you about this is there's a lot of patients that you think you have CCI, but there's some other problem in your spine that we see that could be causing some of your problems as well. Um, so we might say like, hey, your CCI isn't so bad, but holy smokes, what's happening down below needs attention from Dr. Centeno or myself. And that's why I'm sure he's going to talk to you about those things as well. Uh, James, I think I have a short neck, if that makes any sense. And that makes it look like I'm not getting the full range of motion on the DMX. So the suspected CCI is not showing up on the DMX. Any thoughts, Dr. Katz? Well, um, we don't prescribe medication. And yeah, there are some patients that don't have a big range of motion. And that is, um, that can give a um, false negative or false positive. So what we what we tell patients, if you do say like, oh, I feel like my range of motion is limited for whatever reason, is to talk to your medical doc that's gonna, if you're gonna get it, the image to maybe give you something or maybe you get an injection to get more range of motion or a treatment to get more range of motion to have it. Because again, we've had patients that have come in that we try to do the test and they can't move their head. And at that point, if we see that, obviously we can't do the test because we, we want a full range of motion. Uh, Ryan, I have type 2B CCI, lost the cervical lidosis, coming in for a PSL in a few weeks. I have significant sharp grabbing pain in the cervical spine when tilting head back. Yeah, Ryan, I, I think as Dr. Um, Katz will agree, that's pretty common when you have a hard time developing a cervical lordosis as you extend. So those joints tend to compress rather than slide. Um, so that, Evan, any thoughts on that? I mean, to me, it sounds like just not being able to develop that normal lordosis and extension. Yeah. And I think, you know, for Ryan, you know, your first sentence is a huge point. You have upper cervical instability and you have another pathology below. When you have a loss of your curve or even a kyphosis, it is change in mechanics and that change of curvature in your mid cervical spine, you're loading most likely, you're loading the discs and you're also gonna stretch the facet capsules. So as you move, as opposed to having that normal coupling motion, you're, you're, you're now, again, just look at the term structure. The definition of that is an assemblage of material designed to sustain the load. If you damage the structure of your upper cervical ligaments and you damage the structure of your curve, it can no longer sustain a load. That load is both gravity, the shape that your head and you moving. And that's where, you know, when Dr. Zinteno is like, okay, he's going to work on that structure to try to try to improve the structure of the ligaments to sustain more of a load and then trying to get that normal lordosis in so you get better structure and function so that it can start to move appropriately. But most likely with that, you're getting you know, mid cervical facet, or there's irritation because of the kyphosis that's leading to abnormal movement, and that that can hurt. Yeah, so uh, probably increase the curve here. This one I think is for me. Just over two weeks post PICL, having a lot of dysautonomia, tachycardia. It's normal to have these kind of symptoms wrapped up right now. Um, yeah, that can be for the first couple of weeks. Um, if you're having those issues ramped up. You're probably in that fragile aid category, so that means that you're going to probably have a more prolonged recovery. Now, what we've seen in most of those patients is um, if they have a good relationship with a AO or NUCA uh, chiropractor, um, then oftentimes they can be out from the procedure itself. Um, it's one of the reasons why we like patients to try to see if that works before the procedure because many of those patients can then get a quick adjustment by their AO chiropractor, for example, and, and feel much, much better. Uh, it's been advanced by Carla. Are there uh, reliable tests in other DMX that can diagnose CCI? There's nowhere that I can get uh, to England that has a DMX. Yeah, Carla, cervical flexion extension, MRI, we often talk about um, is lower likelihood to show CCI if it's present, but certainly that uh, is one thing to look at. And then, you know, we have a protocol that we can send you that tries to replicate that open mouth lateral bending view um, and then cervical flexion extension uh, x-rays. So those are protocols that we can get you. And I think I also know somebody 
in Europe that might be getting a DMX. Okay. That I've talked to just to say like, cause we know there's a lot of people coming from England and, um, you know, I, I believe I know someone I'm just, I, I'm not going to say yet who just to be sure, but there may be someone that can come and help that I know personally that I can try to assist with as well. And this is Dr. Gaddis, uh, just so everyone knows, Dr. Gaddis uh, is one of our, was last year's fellow here at Centeno Schultz. He's now opened his own practice in the West Palm Beach area. Um, he asked to most radiologists read DMX and how should practitioners vet DMX facilities and interpreters? Um, do you want me to answer that one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what I, we, we had the head radiologist of the hospitals here read our DMXs if we need what's called a pathology report, looking for tumor fracture infection. Um, most radiologists know how to read it because it's, it's x-ray through movement. However, you know, oh, this is, you know, I'm probably going to get myself, you know, I, we've seen a lot of patients get in touch with us and have had DMXs from other places. We had one person last week and the image was terrible and the report was basically someone just you know so i don't know the best way to tell you how to how to vet them um i think what you could do is say hey can you give me an example of a report of a dmx that you've done and look to see if they're what it looks like because i've seen really good ones and then i've seen some that i'm like this is I i'd be embarrassed so, yeah i think what we've yeah. seen is is that in general, we can work with most of what we get. Um, you know, I think you would want to make sure that the DMX facility can measure distances because we've seen some that just sort of produce narrative reports without distances. Um, and then to add, ask, or really answer uh, Dr. Gass's questions, most traditional radiologists won't read DMX. They're usually read at the local chiropractic clinic that has the DMX machine. Um, and we overread them all. Um, so we never just look at the report. Right. Um, Sherry Scott, would it be possible to get a workup by Dr. Katz and get treated for CCI on the same trip to Colorado? Yeah, we do that all the time. Um, so a lot of our patients see Dr. Katz for DMX. Um, if you want to also see Dr. Katz for workup with regard to curve restoration, all of that stuff is possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dr. Katz, any insightful info you can share regarding your latest blinded multi-patient study you've been working on, any factors that preserved correlated with successful outcomes? Uh, that's, yeah, you take that one. I'm not quite sure what he's talking about. Yeah. Um, well, we have, um, we have one paper that's coming out that we haven't talked about, which is actually has to do with degenerative uh, disc disease, but that's not upper cervical. Um, so I don't know if that's what you have met, but we, you know, in the paper that we did publish, there was a correlation with successful outcomes. Now, um, if I'm reading the last question correctly, um, do we see like certain markers that, hey, this person is going to have a better outcome than other markers? Um, I haven't really seen that of, uh, other than, of course, patients with um, connective tissue disorders like EDS, they're harder, right, obviously. Um, just because genetically their ligaments aren't going to be able to um, to deform or become as plastic as uh, someone without EDS, so we know for sure that that is an outcome. The one the one interesting thing with EDS patients, I think, it's just because of how flexible they are, is they just love the treatment and the traction, and they can take it more than anyone because they're just used to. Unfortunately, they're pretty bendy. Gotcha. Uh. <laughs> How would a patient deal with lost range of motion um, and still get a good DMX? You know, we can give you Valium um, and try to relax uh, as a muscle relaxer. That's one option. Uh, Evan, you've got any, do you have any thoughts on yeah, patients have poor range of motion? Yeah, I think find out why you have the poor range of motion. Chiropractic care can be really helpful if it's really bad. The, you know, the PRP lysate injections that, you know, Dr. Centeno does can really help with that acute no range of motion. But yeah, if you come in and you have no range of motion, we, I, I wouldn't suggest doing it because it's just not going to be um, as accurate. So I would take the other, the other courses of care to figure out why is your range of motion so low and then what can you do to improve that range of motion. And then 
analyze it. And that's something we tell docs also is, hey, you don't know if they have upper cervical instability yet. Do what you can to get better range of motion, but you know, document that that may be there. And as the range of motion goes up, you may want to be um, you may want to be tested to see if that's there. But you need that full range of motion. Uh, this is a question I get a lot, yeah. um, and that is the radiation dosage from DMX, uh, yeah. chest X-ray or chest CT scan equivalent. 80, 80 X-rays seems very, very high to me for a DMX exposure. Maybe there was a uh, some prolonged, prolonged um, imaging that needed to be done on this particular patient. I'm not quite sure. Can you see my screen? Uh, yeah, I'll add it. Okay, so we get asked that a lot. And look, there there is radiation um, with certain tests. Uh, we do everything, my wife and I, to minimize it. Like if we see instability right away on the view, we're not going to do three more views because we see it. It's there. Um, we have a pretty good, uh, we, we can see it. So we can minimize it that way. We do have the state that comes in every year through the state of Colorado. We have to be, the machine has to be registered and everything else. Um, but this is also from the company, which I have nothing to do with the company. Um, this is what they came up with as well as what they have shown and what I believe the state, um, when they come to our um, facility shows as well. So really they looked at a static X-ray um, uh, looking at what's called a seven view series. They call it a Davis series, which is a lateral flexion extension, A to P, obliques and open mouth view. Um, and they are showing the radiation dose of 770 MR and the DMX, if we do it pretty quickly is about 670. So there's not, the, the thing with, I'm gonna um, stop my screen share. The thing with DMX, um, and radiation is, it's horrible at doing thoracic and lumbar spines because it has such, it shoots down at such a low radiation. That's why we don't do them. So I know some centers say they can, I don't think it's diagnostic because it's great for an extremity, a jaw and a cervical spine. Um, so there is some radiation, but when they compare it and we have the state comes in, this is about the numbers we have. Like we didn't have to let our walls um, in our DMX room because of the low amount of radiation. I'm not gonna say there's no radiation, there is, but um, it's pretty low, especially relative to like CT or nuclear bone scan. And then you just have to look at the pros and cons of knowing if you have instability or abnormal cervical biomechanics that might be able to get better with certain treatments, knowing that or not. Um, but that's the numbers that we have. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna mention that those numbers are probably not accurate. Uh, SCT is seven uh, milliservants, um, not uh, 700. Um, and there's no way a DMX is producing 672. So I, I don't think that's accurate information. Okay. Yeah, we have the numbers also from our state that we can, yeah, yeah actually the, the so physicist was just in about a month ago that we have. It. Information is accurate there. Uh, it's been advanced by Harold. Uh, it's possible to have Simpson CCI shown in Dr. Tone's diagram with all the symptoms and not have, it's possible to have the symptoms. Yeah, I think what you're talking about there is craniocervical syndrome. So uh, CCI just produces upper cervical symptoms. Upper cervical symptoms exist outside of CCI. In fact, most people with upper cervical symptoms do not have CCI. Uh, and so I think it's important to realize that it's much more common out there for people to have headaches related to the upper neck dizziness related to the upper neck um, and have no CCI whatsoever. Uh, that's called a, what we call craniocervical syndrome and uh, then CCI. Um, and I think the problem is that patients come in through the CCI door through Facebook and through uh, Google searches and reading websites. And they believe then that all of these symptoms related to the upper cervical spine are only associated with CCI. They're not. Uh, Eric, uh, is the odontoid inner space asymmetry usually seen in people with large overhangs? Why do some CCI patients have large asymmetry while others don't? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is uh, two of the parameters that we looked at in our paper. And we did find that um, some patients do have 
um, asymmetry. Um, you know, and that that brings up another question that should probably be studied as well. Um, I, I can tell you my anecdotal evidence where are asymptomat or asymmetric overhangs more symptomatic than bilateral instability. Um, but what we've seen um, is some, again, there's so many different variables, right? Um, in the odontoid interspace or even just the lateral, we looked at um, some asymptomatic individuals did have a change in the periodontal space, um, but not as, not as much. Some had uh, lateral translation in the asymptomatic population, but not as much as the symptomatic. But having them both together, we didn't see in the asymptomatic population. But can I correlate that, hey, someone with eight millimeters is always gonna be more symptomatic than someone with five millimeters? Um, no, and there's a lot of different reasons. There, you know, you have men and women. Women have been shown to have longer, narrower canals. That's why they usually get hurt more in crashes. They've shown mechanically. Some people have a, a narrower canal to begin with, which is another aspect. So uh, if you move, let's say you have a narrower canal and you move five millimeters, but it encroached up to four millimeters, that's going to be worse than someone with eight millimeters with a large canal that only encroached two millimeters if that makes sense. So I can't say, I don't know if Dr. Centeno has seen different that you could say, hey, bigger instability means more symptomatology uh, and vice versa, if, if I'm reading that correctly. No. Um, Bo, uh, if someone had CCI for 13 years with examples of long-term reversal of neurological problems that can happen. Yeah, Bo, I think what you're bringing up is something I often mention, that is the longer you have this, um, you're just more likely to be in the category of the neurologic irritation that causes many of these neurologic symptoms, turning into more of a permanent thing. Um, and it's one of the reasons that if we catch someone within the first year uh, of having CCI, um, many times that's a single procedure and the person is, is really asymptomatic then going forward very quickly. Um, so I think that's what you're bringing up. Um, it's really any of the neurologic symptoms, anything from tachycardia to uh, irritation of the nerve causing headaches to POTS, et cetera. Um, Grace, uh, could you speak in the cause of prevention and treatment of vagal nerve neuropathy in CCI patients? Yeah. Yeah, Grace, there's a whole video on that. There's a whole Facebook Live on that. So if you go to the YouTube channel, go under Lives, and then just search vagus nerve, there's a ton on there. Uh, regarding uh, vagus nerve. Uh, uh, chaos, Dr. Cass, is there anything that can be done when C2 is rotated? Uh, yeah, um, well, one, you find out why it's rotated. Sometimes you can get what's called a translation. And when your head translates, you'll see that in the A to P view and even some on the open mouth view. Um, is that rotated because it's, it's injured and it's in a sense stuck that way? Or is it a compensatory mechanism where your head is being translated to one side, which is going to cause that coupling motion and rotation. So when we see that, we look at not just C2. We're going to look at everything as it relates to C2, and that could even be as far down as your low back, um, is looking at that whole structure. So we see these, you know, we do pre and post images on all of our patients that go through to see if we've improved the curve and the stability. And a lot of times when we see these rotations, um, or these translations, um, as we start to figure out the why, why is it rotated, we can start to adjust it appropriately to get it back into that normal structure so that it's not it's not rotated. So yeah, there, there's a number of things that can be done based on why is it, why it is rotated. Okay, so we have a few dozen questions to get to. So we're gonna go in a rapid fire answer mode, three or four sentences max. Uh, okay. Vicky, for people who had ACDF, can DMX still be able to do a good job with imaging since the patient's range of motion is limited? Yeah, because we measure, you know, we measure the segments that can move above it. Um, and unfortunately with ACFD or ACDF, if you need that surgery, obviously you needed it because you got it. Um, the areas above and below can become um, less stable. And then we measure that. We just obviously, the ones that are fused, we're not going to see it see it move or we shouldn't. Ryan, is there any treatment procedures for curve correction post PICL as well exercise and strengthening? 
Um, yeah, we, Ryan, we frequently recommend curve correction, as I'm sure uh, Evan has seen. Some CCI patients can't tolerate curve correction, some can. And sometimes we have to get them more stable before they can. Mm -hmm. uh, Lanaya, do you have any evidence uh, uh, for patients who are pre PSL or post PSL or advice uh, responded negatively to upper cervical adjustments in the past? I have type 2B, rotated C2, negative AO experience, uh, but I know staying in alignment is important for the procedure. I know that I can tell you there is that not all patients do well with um, every treatment approach and AO is very vector dependent, so maybe the right vectors weren't used. Evan, your thoughts on that one? So my thought on this too is you got to look at, you know, when you, you use the term staying in alignment, but you have to look at the whole neck. Is the neck in alignment to begin with? You know, if you might have your upper cervical is out and you have a significant kyphosis, that significant kyphosis also needs to be addressed or else you're not in normal alignment. So we have to look at all of those things and how that equates to pulling on your cord and pulling on your upper neck. And that's where I like to look at that whole, like, all right, we're going to look at your upper neck, but also you may be out of alignment and far from normal alignment below it. And we need to work on the two. Uh, it's been advanced by Harry Winston. If, uh, if I were to see you, Dr. Katz, when we fly into town for the PSL procedure, could you give us guidelines for the chiropractor that we see in England? Are, are there oh, yeah. any CP docs in England? I'm, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I know, I know uh, one, Dr. Monica, who is great. And all I ask is like, look, I'm here to help. I can't, you know, I, I can't help you when you're not in my office with treatment, but I'm here to be a resource, right? Like I will do my best to put you in touch with someone. And then I just urge you to be your own advocate. If that doc that you're seeing won't take the time to reach out to me, let's try to find you someone else. Um, and then I could do my best to try to help. Cause look, I, after 20 years, we know how much you, you're all suffering and trying to find. And I know that there's docs that are going to get you in and get you out and say they do it and don't, but we, I do know some docs in, in England that, are really good, really skilled, and will take the time to reach out to me, and I'll just help you any way that I can. Uh, NARS, in Europe, DMX not available, but uh, VFX ray, can can VFX ray provide some valuable insights? Um, yeah, we have seen a couple well done. We just saw one from China, uh, video fluoroscopy that seemed to mimic a DMX. Um, Evan, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, the only thing we see with the fluoro, because it's, I think they're like 10 or 15 a second, frames per second compared to 30, is you get that ghosting. And then sometimes it would just be really hard to, to clearly see the margins, especially at the ADI space. Um, and then also if you're standing up or not during the, the fluoro might change that as well. But I, again, sit tight. And I, I'll post something to Dr. Centeno if the person in Europe does get a DMX. Great. Uh, Anya, uh, is Sojourn syndrome a contraindication for regenerative medicine? Uh, not that we've seen so far. Uh, I would say about one in four of our patients have an autoimmune diagnosis. So it's pretty common for us to see various autoimmune conditions or diagnoses. In addition, I'd be a little careful there because Again, there's a medical autoimmune diagnosis, meaning that you saw a medical specialist and got that diagnosis. And then there's what I call an alternative medicine or functional medicine autoimmune diagnosis, where the standards for that diagnosis are much, much lower than the traditional medicine diagnosis. So we do differentiate between those two things. Uh, chaos, uh, pressing are too fast or anything that be done when C2 is rotated, but there's no scoliosis. Doctors only told me that there's no such thing as rotated C2. Uh, I'll have an Evan comment on this, but I think when you're talking to a doctor about a rotated C2, their only context for that is someone in the emergency room after a huge crash, and there's enough rotation to require immediate emergency surgery. If it's less than that, then they're not going to understand what it is you're talking about. Evan? Yeah, I agree with that because... I mean, it's normal coupling motion and what abnormal movement is or what's called subluxations are, um, you know, so I, I would just get someone like, hey, reach out to me, see, let me see what your x-rays look like and I'll see if I can, you know, take a quick glance at it and help you. But 
Um, we need to find you someone where you live that's going to be able to understand this and look at it to help you. Uh, Eric, after correcting the cervical curve, does CCI get better because there's less load on the ligaments, the ligaments can heal on their own? I mean, that's what we showed in our paper, and that's what we've seen in 20 years. Not saying it's 100%. You know, anyone who tells you that they're going to get someone better 100% of the time is lying. But that's typically what we see. It's, I mean, think about this. If you had low back pain and hip pain, and you were walking around once you on and once you off, do you think it's going to heal correctly? It's not. So getting better structure will ensure better function. And when you have better structure and function and better load distribution and movement, you're not irritating that injured area as much and you can give it a better chance to heal. And that's what we see. And that's when we send our patients also for the pickle procedure. We're like, hey, this is what you have going on. You also have a loss of curve. The upper cervical ligaments are damaged. The pickle procedure is going to give it a really a better chance of healing. While that's happening, we're going to slowly try to implement the curve so that it heals in a more lordotic position with better load distribution, and then it can heal, right? You wouldn't heal if you tore your ACL. You wouldn't you wouldn't put in a cast that's pulling on the ACL, right? It wouldn't uh, stay hard to heal. May, is there any difference between DMX and DDR? Yeah, so I think the DDR is just a, a measurement. Um, so, well, I take that back. I think the new DDR is it's an x-ray that's being sold that pulses. And I really like it for the lumbar spine. But the only thing I don't like about it is it only shoots because I've talked to them. It's only at 10 frames a second. So you get this pulsing. And that brings up another thing that Dr. Centeno and I have been seeing is what's called, Dr. Centeno called it fluttering, where we see this, this pulsing of C1. And you, we've seen other images where stuff slips that you would miss it with that 10 or 15 frames a second because of the pulsing. So I don't think it's as accurate um, simply because of the pulsing, because of some of that mid-phase movement that we can miss. Uh, Vicky, uh, question Dr. Centeno, do you need a DMX every time for a PICL procedure? Um, not necessarily. I mean, if I can diagnose instability um, off of a cervical functional upright MRI, then there are times that we haven't done a DMX. Having said that, they diagnose different kinds of instability. Um, so the DMX is almost always something I push for to try to get a complete picture. In addition, it allows us to go back and track results much more easily. Uh, so as Evan knows, we'll frequently send people in for just one or two views to make sure we've made progress. And that's something that's hard to do with an upright MRI. Um, this is a question for Evan, Dr. Katz, how bad is C2 axial rotation of 19 degrees on the left? Well, again, it, as we mentioned, even with upper cervical is how is it affecting you? When does it bother you? And is that the primary issue? So it can, again, it can be bad for you or there's something else that's happening causing that that could also be bad. Right? I and think they're asking about the degree and I usually do this for patients. So for instance, someone comes in and they've got six millimeters of overhang, right? Yeah. They want to know how bad that is. I tell them zero through 10, uh, zero being totally nothing there, 10 being the worst overhangs we see, six is about a five or a six out of 10. Oh, okay. Where is 19 degrees fit in that zero through 10 scale? Meaning of the measurements that you do for uh, C2 axial rotation, is that on and the low it, end, medium end, or high end? Um, and if you're tilting, right? If we're talking about during the movement, you want some rotation. So that's not on the high end. If you're neutral and you yeah, have I think you're talking about neutral. Oh, neutral, that you're, that's getting up there, right? You shouldn't have 19 degrees of rotation just on neutral. It should, it should, you know, if, if this is the uh, C2, sorry, because my camera's backwards. When you tilt, it should, it should rotate. But if you're standing straight and it's rotated by 19 degrees, that's, that's a pretty big, that could be a, middle to upper middle deformity of rotation. Okay, so on the, on the larger side. Uh, fever, main are using tools like the Y-strap. Evan and I have talked about the Y-strap more times than I can count. Um, the Y-strap, Evan, why don't you describe it? It's this so, thing that you put around your head. Yeah, so, uh, boy, this is a whole other topic. I'm gonna be careful, I'm not gonna mention the name because I mentioned the name and someone 
they threatened to sue me for using the name because um, I made a video about this. Um, and I always say, why strap someone's neck and yank on it? I look, it gets a lot of views. And I think that's why, unfortunately, a lot of docs do it. They're getting views and maybe they're making money because they get clicks. Would I ever do that procedure? No. And I also feel that it's not taught by a school. It's not taught by any governing body. Putting a, our ligaments are not supposed to, our neck doesn't go like ETs. We're not supposed to get a distraction like that with enough force that moves your 150 pound body with a coefficient of friction underneath it as well to make, to pull. So I, I see that and I'm like, that they're getting a ton of views. It, I, it, I, me personally, um, I wouldn't do that. I, I would not do that. Gotcha. You mean, uh, frequently have first rib subluxation is where muscle will be responsible for this. Yeah, tight scalings can do it. Uh, scoliosis can do it. Um, or obviously being hypermobile can do it. Um, and or some injury to the ligaments that hold on, uh, hold that first rib to the spine. Um, as far as keeping it in alignment, a lot of it depends on the answers to all of those questions. Uh, Rishi, Dr. Katz, what's normal ADI for a 33-year-old male in flexion and extension? Well, so Dr. Zentan and I were just talking about this. There's a new study that came out that the ADI actually gets less as you get older, but it shouldn't go over about three to three and a half millimeters um, in flexion. Yeah, and I think what I posted on these guys or to these guys was there was a study looking at the ADI was larger in younger people. Mm -hmm. uh, simply because it has articular cartilage in there. And then over time, the articular cartilage wears down. So uh, I think it was about three millimeters or so in a young person as you get any age on you, i.e. if you're in your 40s or 50s, let's say 50s, anything over two was substantially abnormal. Uh, Goose, if my muscles tightened up in the neck while working and cause all kinds of neurologic issues two months ago, and is it getting better or is it just muscle nerves causing symptoms and not the spine? Don't know the answer to that one, Goose. Um, Stacy, uh, hi, Dr. C, totally overdue to tighten. Wondering about your thoughts on loosening the fascia and whether it's more effective before or after injections. Um, yeah, if you've got fascial tightness, myofascial release, rolfing, all of that can be really great stuff. Um, so I think uh, all of that can be complementary. Um, a really common issue would be this kind of stuff that we all see, fascial tightness up here, fascial tightness down in the psoas. You know, working with a good rolfer or myofascial release person can be very, very helpful uh, mm -hmm. tomorrow. I've had failed fusion at C1-2, worsening instability from C0 to C7, and reverse curve from C4. Do you think regenerative medicine can save me from more surgery? Yeah, I often tell these people, I often tell patients, once you've had the C1, C2 fusion, um, you are very hard for us to help. Um, uh, all of this kind of stuff should have been done long before the C1, C2 fusion. Um, so uh, not saying we can't help. We have seen some patients who have had a C1-C2 fusion um, and have been able to help them catch as catch can here and there, but it makes it much, much harder and that person much harder to treat with any regenerative medicine once they've had a C1-C2 fusion. So um, certainly happy to take a look to see if we can help but the likelihood of us being able to help goes way down once C1, C2 is fused. And uh, just for tomorrow also, if you want to reach out to me, um, I don't know where you are, but having that reverse curve also is something that could be helped with. And I'm really sorry that that fusion failed, but maybe I could try to find you someone where you are that could help with that reversal of the curve. Uh, Rishi, uh, Dr. Katz, uh, how long should you lay on a dinner roll for? So we always start uh, really slow and making sure that you're in the right position, your skull's in the right place. Um, we don't go, we, we like to go at five minutes simply because the rheology or the ligaments, meaning when they start to deform, to change shape, like braces on teeth, starts at around five, and then you're not getting a whole lot of benefit after 20. So we always, a lot of patients, they can't even do a minute to begin with, but we try to get into that five minute mark and then 
after 20 minutes, you're like, you can stay on it if you want, but you're not getting a ton of extra um, benefit. So we'd like to see at least five and then work your way up from there. But again, make sure it's in the right spot. Uh, Greg, um, Evan, I don't think we answered this before. How many chest X-ray equivalent do you think the average DMX is? Well, I, so um, I don't know. I, I uh, compared to a chest X-ray, I didn't honestly. I haven't looked at what a regular chest X-ray is. I just looked at it compared to like uh, a seven series of the neck. Because um, I don't so go compared to a seven series. How many seven series? I think they said it's equivalent to maybe. If we can get it done in about two minutes, it's equivalent to maybe one to one and a half, seven series. But also, yeah, is what right. so, it looks like it is. So that would be much, much less than the average CT scan. Yeah. Um, Stacy, Dr. Postal Weight has a good handle on which doctors do a good or bad job doing DMX. I don't know. I've never talked to him about that. Um, let's see here. Bo, I've been told my body structure is not as perpendicular as most, but it, where it makes, where my, it takes my CCI even more. Yeah, I think what you're talking about maybe, uh, Bo, is, is if you've got some scoliosis, it's going to make things a little more challenging. Um, something I think we don't see a lot of upper cervical chiropractors account for is the concept that scoliosis leads to rotation in the upper cervical spine uh, because of that couple motion that that Evan was talking about. Um, oh, this is James again. Uh, any good CBP guys that you work with in the South Florida area? Yeah, I know a bunch. Just Dr. Gaddis, get in touch with me. And uh, yeah, I know quite a few that are down there. I My uh, geography of what is considered South Florida, I don't want to, but reach out to me. I know, I know several. Um, Aaron, uh, Dr. Dr. Katz, what nerve causes the eyes to shake back and forth? Um, yeah, I think it's more upper cervical proprioceptive issues, so not necessarily a nerve, a nerve pathway, if you will. Um, and uh, after PICL3, this has not happened for me anymore. Yeah, so I think that's probably just getting stability in the upper cervical spine, not as much bad input coming in from those upper neck uh, joints. Um, thoughts on posture ray versus digital motion x-ray. Um, posture ray is kind of a part. Uh, so, yeah, so um, they're completely different things. Oh, digital okay. motion x-ray is, is the image itself. Posture ray is a, the software to digitize and measure the images from a regular x-ray or MRI or DMX. So I use posture ray to measure my digital motion x-rays or MRIs or anything like that. Gotcha. Um, uh, Josh. Yeah, Josh, um, uh, elongated style load processes are normal. Uh, that's not abnormal. Um, so this is a really Good question um, for everyone to focus on. Um, there's nothing abnormal about elongated styloid processes and they're not even elongated, they're just calcified ligaments. So that's a totally normal finding. Uh, the question is whether or not that elongated styloid process needs to be cut in an Eagle syndrome surgery. Um, and the answer is um, almost never does that need to be done. Um, if you've got craniocervical instability, it's more likely that that's just providing a hard backstop for the upper cervical transverse processes to beat against. And so you have to get rid of the instability. Um, but the bottom line is, and large cellular processes are totally normal, found in all sorts of people walking around out there that have no symptoms of Eagle syndrome. So by themselves, it's a meaningless finding. Uh, and I think this is our last question because it's two and I've got a, a, a follow on here. So safe to get chiropractic adjustments in case of elongated styloids and jugular compression. Evan. Uh, if you're going to the right chiropractor, right? If you're going to one that's yanking your skull, um, you know, so it, it, let's not lump it together. But we've seen a lot of patients elong elongated styloids. 
um, and even jugular compression. And we published a paper in the Journal of Brain Circulation that we've actually improved blood flow into the brain due to what's happening in the cervical spine. So we've seen it and it's been safe, um, knock on wood. So um, in our office, I'd say, yeah, as you have an appropriate workup. Gotcha. Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much. We've been at this for about an hour and I've got a follow on meeting here at, at two o'clock mountain, my time. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Katz for being here. Um, I know he's got a busy schedule and uh, I want to thank everyone for the great questions. We tried to get through, we got through maybe, I don't know, three or four dozen questions. There's about two dozen we didn't get to. Um, so thanks for all the great questions. Uh, come back next week. We'll try to get, I'll try to answer uh, any additional questions. Uh, Evan, any uh, parting thoughts on all of this? No, I think for patients that are suffering with CCI, I understand you're not alone. And there's docs like myself and Dr. Centeno that are here to help you get your life back and um, do everything we can to help. If you have any questions, just reach out to me. Um, uh, if you're not in Colorado, I can try to find you someone where you live. I just want to try to help everyone get appropriate curve correction and stability and, um, and the diagnostics so you can have a, a better quality of life. So we appreciate you all and um, don't hesitate to reach out. Okay. Thanks, Evan, uh, Thank for being here. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks.